All right, in continuation of this discussion of weather maps, we're going to add weather fronts. And now weather fronts involve looking at the interactions of air masses. So in the previous Ed Puzzle video, uh, we talked about how there are five major air masses that affect the United States. Well, now we'll look at what happens when two air masses come in contact with each other. Because one contains warm air and one contains cold air, they can't just come together, they have to uh, interact in a, in a very specific way. So the definition of a weather front are boundaries that separate air masses of different densities. One air mass is usually warmer and contains more moisture than the other. And, friends, uh, and, sorry, and, and fronts can form between any two contrasting air masses. So all you need is some difference is uh, all you need is some differences in uh, moisture content and temperature and you have yourself the makings of a weather front. So I want to show you just a very quick experiment that was done to represent how warm and cold air behave. And it will give you a good foundation for everything we're going to look at in the next couple of um, images. So let's watch this quick video. In this film, we'll see a demonstration that will help to show what happens when warm air meets cold air in the Earth's atmosphere. We'll use water to simulate the behavior of the air. I put tap water into this tank. Now I'll add this plastic gate in the middle to divide the tank into two halves. Next, I'm going to add some warm water to this side and some cold to this side. I've also dissolved some instant coffee granules in the cold water so that we can see where it goes. Now I'll pull out the gate and we'll see what happens. They don't immediately mix together. Instead, the lighter warm water rises and overruns the cold. The more dense cooler water sinks and undercuts the warm water. Notice that the movement is one way at the top and the other way at the bottom. All right, did you notice that the um, experiment demonstrated how warm air always occupies the top, uh, so to speak, um, and cold air always occupies the bottom? That goes back to a very basic concept we addressed when we first started talking about weather, uh, that warm air is less dense, cold air is more dense, and that is the interaction between the two. So let's look at our first weather front. We'll start with a cold front. And that's the boundary between an advancing cold air mass, so incoming cold air, that is meeting a warm air mass. And when this occurs, you, you have this cold air that's dense and wedging itself underneath the warm air. And as a result, it's forcing it to rise quickly. So here's an animation designed to show just that. Here comes the cold air, it's a big wedge forcing itself underneath the warm air. The warm air rises and does so rather quickly to create clouds and precipitation. So the cold air is denser, occupies the bottom, and pushes, it's called frontal lifting, pushes the warm air up. And that forces it to condense and reach its dew point and drop water vapor or I'm sorry, drop precipitation back down onto the Earth's surface. Looking at it another way, this is a diagram. Cold air is on your left, warm air is on your right, and um, it's showing how the cold air is wedging itself underneath the warm air. Okay. The other uh, type of front, the next type of front is a warm front. Uh, warm fronts are the boundary between an advancing warm air mass and a retreating wedge of cooler air mass. So once again we have the same interaction only it's reversed. Instead of warm air being in the area first, now we have cold air in the area first. And here comes the warm air. The warm air is moving in very slowly and being forced to rise. And as it rises it, it expands, it condenses, reaches the dew point, condensation, 
forms, which forms clouds. Clouds lead to precipitation, that, that whole step-by-step -step procedure. Notice how long it takes. Warm, warm fronts do take a long time to develop into precipitation. It's not as immediate, it's not a, as quick of a change as a cold front is. Okay, so just one other way of looking at it. Here's the warm air on the left and the cold air on the right. The cold air was already in the area and warm air gradually moves in. And instead of it being heavy rains and uh, something like severe thunderstorms, which are associated with cold fronts or incoming cold fronts, you have very light and moderate precipitation. So because these are the two central types of fronts, so because these are the two most basic types of fronts, let's talk about their differences. Uh, for one, as already described, cooler air is denser and always occupies the bottom. Warm air is less dense and always occupies the top. Right? So that's what's happening at either front, but it's always the same relationship. And in terms of symbols on a weather map, cold air, um, and in terms of symbols on a weather map, the cold front has these blue triangles. And the way that they're drawn are they're pointing in the direction the cold air is moving. So here's my cold air on the left side. Here's my warm air on the right side. These triangles are pointing to show that the cool air or the cold air is moving into the warm air. Over here with the warm front, we are using red semicircles. Warm air is on this side, cold air is on this side, and the semicircles are pointing in the direction that the warm air is moving. Cold air is already there, and warm air is moving in to overtake it. One other difference, and this is important as well, is how precipitation falls as a result of either front. If you take a look at the rain, this shaded in area that's now blue represents precipitation. In the case of the warm front, it's occupying you know, the, the region at the front and all the way ahead of it. Okay, it's a big, large area of precipitation. Um, in the case of the cold front, the only precipitation that's occurring is right at the front, right at the boundary, okay, right at the boundary between cold and warm air. So that just brings up an important statement to remember that in the cases of warm fronts and cold fronts, rain will always fall ahead of the warm front. So well ahead of where the boundary is between warm and cold air, the rain will fall. But at a cold front, it's right at the boundary. That'll make more sense in an upcoming lab when we do it. Let's see if you remember that. All right, let's move on. There's actually two more fronts to talk about, and they're the combination of warm fronts and cold fronts. The first one is an occluded front, and um, it's the boundary of opposing wedges of cold air masses formed when a cold front overtakes a warm front. And this forces the warm air that's trapped in the middle to lift off the ground looks something like this. So you already have a warm front and here comes some cold air. And warm air is trapped in the middle, has nowhere to go but up. It forces it to rise, turns to clouds, turns into some heavy precipitation. On a weather map, an occluded front looks like this. The real symbol is all the way up here. The purple or pink, whichever one you want to call it, that's what an occluded front looks like but it's the combination of the cold front, the triangles, and the semicircles, the warm front. And what's basically happening is you have warm air or a warm front already in place. Warm air here, cold air here. That's why that's a warm front. But here comes cold air. And that cold air is advancing on the warm air, and the warm air is trapped in the middle. And that warm air has nowhere else to go but up. And that produces this symbol or this behavior called an occluded front. Just another way to look at it. Once again, you have your cold front, but a warm front already formed. And that cold air advances on the warm air. And the warm air is trapped in the middle. And it's forced to rise. So if we look at an actual weather map, 
Here's a low pressure system right in the middle showing an occluded front. Uh, to the north, you have an occluded front already formed. Um, if you look uh, kind of east or west of the low, you can see the cold front over here. This is the cold front. This is the warm front. So if I were to include where the cold and warm air are, here's the cold air, here's the warm air, here's the cold air. The cold air here is moving this way, the warm air here is moving that way, and the cold air on this side is uh, kind of whipping around and joining the cold air on the other side because the low pressure system is forcing things to rise. So it creates this turbulence in the atmosphere. And um, these are actual uh, events that are called mid-latitude cyclones. And they can produce some really severe weather, mostly rain, but sometimes some really strong winds. And we'll talk more about those when we discuss storms. So once again, an occluded front has these triangles and semicircles pointed in the same direction because warm air and cold air are both basically on the same side as they are joining up and moving in the same direction. Last type of front, a stationary front. A stationary front forms between two adjacent air masses with different characteristics, but it will remain in the same position. And when I say different characteristics, they have uh, maybe warm air, cold air, but they're not different enough for one to overtake the other, so to speak. So in other words, here's your cool, cool air on the left and your warm air on the right. And even though they are different temperatures, maybe they have very similar moisture content, which makes them a lot more um, the same. And neither one of them can really push the other one out of the way. So you get like a tug of war, a stalemate. Neither one is winning. Neither one is overtaking the other. And as a result, the word stationary means not to move. You have some weather event that hangs out for multiple days. Um, so a stationary front on a weather map would look like this. Uh, the semicircles show the direction the warm air is moving in. The triangles show the direction the cold air is moving in. And they're on either side of the front. And at that boundary, neither one is pushing the other out of the way. So with all this information, pressure systems and fronts, you can get an idea of how weather prediction takes place. I mean, it does take a lot more skill and a lot more practice, but if you watch what's happening here, you, you have a sense of what's going on. You have these pressure systems and weather fronts moving across the United States because of the jet stream from west to east. And if you know what weather fronts and pressure systems are to the west of you, you can pretty much predict accurately, to some degree, your incoming weather. Because if it's uh, low pressure or high pressure, and it's right now west of New York State, in the next day or two, it should head our direction and bring very similar weather our way. So we will definitely look at this in more detail in school. Uh, there's a lab associated with creating your own weather map, which we will do together. And um, that's it for now. So thanks for watching.